Good morning, Living Streams. My name is Alex Seekins, and welcome to church. Uh, hey, we are in the middle of our fasting season. Hopefully, you've been tracking along with that. David did a really wonderful introduction to this season last Sunday, and I encourage you to go back and listen to it if you haven't. But we're calling uh, everybody who calls this family, who calls this home, uh, to engage in the fast by uh, by a fast of, of, of stepping away, of abstaining from something, and also by a practice of, of engagement, right? Of, of what do we do to replace that time to engage with the Lord. And so, Hopefully uh, you're abstaining from something if the Lord is calling you to do that, if you're joining with us uh, for these 21 days. Hopefully you're joining us in a Wednesday evening, or sorry, a Wednesday fast until 6 o'clock. Uh, and uh, and hopefully uh, you're interested in maybe joining us in signing up for our prayer room too. So the last week of that, you can go to livingstreams.org slash connect, uh, and you can sign up to spend about an hour or more uh, during the course of the week in our prayer room. So uh, we'd love to see you engage in that. It really is a powerful season of just engaging with spiritual disciplines and all that sort of stuff. Uh, going along with our fasting season today, David Stockton is preaching a message on solitude as we're really looking to Jesus and the things that he did in that little period in the wilderness right after he was baptized uh, and the practices that we can learn from him. So he'll, we'll be talking about that and I think solitude is a valuable uh, spiritual practice that is man swimming upstream in our society isn't it it's so uncomfortable for us uh, but there's something valuable about getting alone and being alone with the Lord and, and getting some space from that um, also today is a day for baptism so we're gonna be having some baptisms today we'd love to just uh, encourage you that if you're feel of the Lord moving on your heart uh, to get baptized maybe if you're watching one of the earlier services you can always drive down here and get spontaneously baptized for one of the later services or you can email Kurt at living streams.org k-u-r-t uh, and talk about getting baptized the next time we do baptisms we usually do them every three months or so um, and we think it's a really valuable step uh, in the process of following the lord for all believers um, on our Wednesday nights, to end those Wednesday uh, fasts that we have as a congregation, at 6 o'clock over in the gym, we'll be having some soup together, a little bit of community, and then at 7 o'clock, we'll be having a prayer service every single Wednesday. So we'd love to see you there this Wednesday for some soup and some prayer, uh, kind of closing up a day of fasting together. Hopefully, you'll be able to make it out. Um, and then the last, uh, uh, well, I guess the second to last announcement that I have for you today is we have a team of people that are going to be helping refugees to learn English and engaging and connecting with them as community. Uh, you can find more information about that and express some interest in that if you go to livingstreams.org slash connect uh, if you're wanting to help out with the refugees. And then our last, last thing for today is, of course, the digital courtyard. Every Sunday after every service at livingstreams.org slash live, we'd love to connect with you. And with that being said, let's worship. Good morning, Living Streams Church. How are we doing? Awesome. It's, it's great weather this morning. Not too hot, not too cold. Just right. Well, would you stand with us, please, as we step into worship? Psalm 68, to the choir master, a psalm of David. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so you, you shall drive them away. As wax melts before fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. But the righteous shall be glad. They shall exult before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Exult before him. The father of the fatherless and protector of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Oh God, when you were before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O God, you shed abroad. You restored your inheritance as it is languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it. In your goodness, O oh God, you provided for the needy. So, Lord, we come before you knowing that you are powerful, all-powerful. Lord, that you bring the prisoners to prosperity as they call upon your name. Lord, that you would ride through the deserts to deliver us, Lord. So we exalt your name this morning, Lord. We just raise, we raise praise and worship unto your name, God, that all other distractions would fall away and that we would solely focus on your son, Jesus, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you sing it out? There 
scissors and crowns down at your feet honor and fame only belong to you for you are before everything grasping it all together one found worthy
good and we see it time and time again. Take a moment just with the Lord to think about the ways that he's shown up for you, that he's been good to you, the testimony that he's built with you. Thank you, Lord. You always show up. You're so consistent. We can count on your goodness day after day in times of, of great joy and celebration and in times of great trouble. You're always there and you're always good. God, we just put honor on your name. We call you what you are, the true thing, that you are good, that you do always show up, that you never let us down. Lord, we love to worship you. Thank you, Lord. Good morning, you guys. It's so great to worship with you. Just take a minute to turn to the person next to you. Tell them good morning. Tell them the Lord is good. Good morning, Living Streams. How you guys doing? Pretty good. Enjoying a little bit of rain. It's always a big deal in Phoenix. Uh, well, my name is Alex Seekins. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at Living Streams, and I've got a couple announcements for you really quick today. Uh, our first announcement is, uh, along with our prayer and fasting season, uh, starting this Thursday and all the way through the following Tuesday, we're going to be having a 24-7 prayer room in the chapel over there. So I would really encourage you, you can sign up at livingstreams.org slash connect. Spend an hour in there. Also, bonus, for those of you who are able, those like middle of the night hours are just such an awesome time. For everybody else, I know that sounds crazy. Uh, but spend an hour in there connecting with the Lord. I, I promise you it is worth the interruption to your schedule this week. Uh, also, we have a number of classes coming up. Uh, on February 4th, we have both the Essentials of Faith class as well as our Grief Share class. Grief Share is a really great place for exactly what it sounds like if you've gone through some grief in life and you need a group of people to walk uh, walk through that with you and kind of walk through that with the Lord, uh, Grief Share would be a great place for that. I'd encourage you, if that's you, uh, just kind of get out of your shell a little bit and start sharing that with some other people. Essentials of Faith is a great class for people who are new believers or people who aren't believers but are maybe considering what it might look like to follow Jesus in his way. Uh, it's also a really great place for people who kind of have been following the Lord for a little while and could use a, a return to the basics. So they run you through kind of, kind of the basics of the worldview of believers and those, those essential practices of following Jesus. Uh, we also have our Explore class coming up on February 28th. That's an awesome class for anybody who's new to Living Streams or maybe you've been around for a little bit and are feeling not quite connected yet. Uh, Explore kind of runs you through who Living Streams is, what the church is, kind of the basics of, of belief, and then also who you are and how you can plug into Living Stream. So we'd love to encourage you to do that if you haven't already, even if you've been around for a while, and especially if you're new. And our last announcement for today is there's this partner ministry that we love to work with called Go10, Go to Every Nation. Uh, and they're just right around the corner. They work with the refugee population. I don't know if you know this, but Phoenix has a huge refugee population. A lot of people come to Phoenix fleeing persecution, fleeing for their lives, and they get resettled here in the valley. And Go10 works with them in a number of different ways, but we actually have a, a handful of people who are really engaged in their English ministry, and it's kind of their, uh, their shallow end of the pool, their easy entry area. It takes just like an hour or two out of your week, as you can, ideally every week, but it's okay if you miss a little bit here and there. 
And, and all you do uh, to serve in their English ministry is you, you pick a slot where they have a class. They have various ones in the morning and in the evening throughout the week. And you sit with a refugee in an English class. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to teach them. You basically pat them on the back as they learn with a computer program. And the goal is that over the course of that time and doing that week after week, you build a friendship. You go and join them for dinner at their house. You invite them over maybe to yours. And you make a friend who maybe you start sharing the gospel with at some point in time. In fact, even today, they're doing this beautiful thing. They have a whole conference for all the Afghan refugees that came here in the last couple of years, and they're kind of pulling them together and um, eventually are hoping to maybe even plant an Afghan church uh, down the road. So a lot of really beautiful things. If you have questions about that or are interested in kind of dipping your toe in the water of serving with refugees, maybe you're interested in reaching out to Muslims. They're not all Muslims, but a lot are. Maybe you're interested uh, in international stuff, but you can't get, you know, outside of the country. I'd encourage you to go to the table uh, in the back, uh, right in front of the sanctuary. Susan Stacy and a handful of other people who serve at GoTen are gonna be there to give you more information on how you can do it. You can also go to livingstreams.org slash connect or our admissions page to fill out a little form and express interest in that. We'd love to encourage you to, to plug in that way. Now with that, uh, why don't you welcome up our senior pastor, David Stockton. He's gonna be bringing the word of the Lord today. Thanks, Alec. I don't know if you guys noticed, I. Because it's hard, because he's got that long dread hair, but his beard is unreal. It's, and I just, I think I just noticed it for the first time because I'm always looking at what's going on <laughs> with the dread. But his beard, he could almost start just dreading that. Is there going to be a competition in the front and the back? <laughs> See what's going on. Um, but anyways, sorry. I was just thinking about that, you know, real important stuff. Um, welcome to Living Streams. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're in our fasting season, which is um, something we just call it. It's a time where we're really just kicking off the year, seeking the Lord, and, and using spiritual practices, spiritual disciplines to do that, including fasting. Uh, we had on Wednesday, last Wednesday, we asked everybody in the church to fast during the day and then join us at 6 p.m. for some soup and then 7 o'clock prayer night. And it was really awesome to see um, a, a large number of people come for prayer, come for something like that. Um, it's not as cool as Netflix or it's not as good as uh, Suns game or something like that, but it's still really cool when people make the time for that. It's better. There you go. Yeah, it's better. Um, but so we're doing that the next two Wednesdays. So this Wednesday and the one after, I'd really encourage you, if you can at all, to try and participate with that. It's something we want to do as a church family. It's something that builds kind of community and unity within us, but also it really does push us towards a connection with Jesus, which is what we desperately need every day of our lives. So with that being said, if you'll grab a Bible and turn to Mark, um, Mark chapter 1 is, is the passage we're going to be in for today. We're just looking at Jesus, learning from Jesus, and, uh, and trying to become a little bit more like Jesus in, in our lives. And we're going to read in Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Give you guys a chance to get there. And they went into Capernaum, Jesus and his disciples, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they, the people that were there at the synagogue, were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in the, their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately, Mark's favorite word, he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. 
And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And when they found him, they said to him, everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, let's go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So last Sunday, we kicked off this fasting season series um, with looking at Jesus getting baptized and then, and then immediately, according to Mark, um, the Spirit leads him into the wilderness where he's there for 40 days and 40 nights without food, in solitude, and he ultimately ends up fighting the devil. And so we dubbed last Sunday the Sunday we're going to focus on fasting. This Sunday we're focusing on solitude, that time in the wilderness. And then next Sunday we're going to focus on fighting with the devil um, so that should be a lively one. <laughs> Don't miss that one. And, uh, and so this next thing that happens is, is, is kind of in line with, with what took place. Jesus went through that wilderness time. He was preparing himself for ministry. He was preparing himself to step into what God had for him. And we want to prepare ourselves to step into what God has for us in this new year. Um, and so we want to do the things that Jesus did. We talked about how it was the private practices of Jesus that led to the beautiful public life of Jesus. There was a connection. There was a correlation. The disciples noticed it's not so much that Jesus knows how to do miracles. It's Jesus knows how to pray. And that results in Jesus being able to do really neat things. And so we want to focus on doing the things that Jesus did so that we can do the things that Jesus did. You following me? Um, so solitude is what we'll talk about today. And in this passage here in Mark we have Jesus doing some interesting things. We have Jesus going into the Sabbath, which was his practice. Jesus went to church, gathered together, and he was teaching. And as he's teaching, the people are blown away because he's teaching as one who has authority, unlike the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. And then while he's teaching, there's actually some guy with an unclean spirit who comes in and basically is like challenging him, kind of saying that he's Jesus and, all, and he's, he's God's son and all these things, but but it's this distraction, this challenging, and Jesus says to this person, be quiet, and come out of him. And this, this demon comes out of this person. And the people are like, I've never been to this church before. <laughs> I'm so glad I came to church today. Is this, like, what's going, what has happened? They were amazed, they were astonished. Because here's someone who was talking about the love of God, talking about the power of God, and then demonstrating the love of God for this person and the power of God over this evil. And they, they were astonished and amazed. They thought, there's something cool about this guy, and his fame spread throughout the whole region. The very next thing Jesus does is he goes into um, Peter's house, one of his disciples, and he's there with the disciples, and they're hanging out, and, and, and he finds out that Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And you, you know Jesus is amazing when he's loving on mother-in-laws, right? He helped a mother-in-law right there on the spot. <laughs> Everyone, some people are like, <laughs> and then they're sitting next to their mother-in-law. They're like, no, 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 no. Mother-in-laws are great. I love them. I have an awesome mother-in-law. But um, anyways, Jesus is, he's, he just, bam, he comes into the house. There's an issue. He just takes her by the hand, lifts her up. And she's better. And what does she do? She starts serving them, which is really kind of cool. And then the next thing you know, people are just lining up at the door. Everyone who has a loved one who is really hurting, and, and I don't have time to get into it, but the whole idea of unclean spirit versus demon possessed is interesting language for Mark. Again, Mark is writing a long, long time ago. And, and for them to come across someone who has a mental illness I, I've been wondering, what, what would they call that? What would they say? Either demon-possessed or an unclean spirit, probably, because they didn't quite have the language for the rest of it. And, and so I love the idea. It's opened up Jesus for me in some ways where he's healing people with physical ailments, but he's also healing people with mental ailments. As well as, and that's not to take away and deny the reality that people can be demon-possessed as well. But I think it kind of encompasses all of those things. Again, don't have time to get into that. But Jesus is doing that. People are showing up at the door. He's healing all of them. Um, and, then, and then it says that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. 
And there he prayed, once again talking about this practice, this rhythm. And everyone was looking for him. And you'll see this over and over in the book of Mark. People are like, where's Jesus? Where'd he go? What's happening? And he, he's off in the desolate place. He's off in the desolate place. And that word desolate is interesting. We'll talk about that. But anyways, first thing I want you to see as I read this passage is Jesus is awesome. How awesome is this, what Jesus is doing? And I love in that song we sang, I'd never heard that song before, but they were talking about the beautiful man. In the, in the song, and I was like, that felt like such confirmation for what I was supposed to talk about today, that, that we first just cannot forget to look and be amazed at Jesus. He is beautiful. His life was beautiful. The reason that people are still talking about Jesus the world over all these years later is because his life was so beautiful, so powerful. He actually helped so many people. And it's still helping people today. So we got to see Jesus is so beautiful. And then the very next thing that I hope happens, the very next thing that's supposed to happen when we look at the beauty of Jesus is that there's a part of us that says, I want to be more like Jesus. That's what the Spirit of God is trying to do. He's trying to form us more into the image of Christ. God saved you the way you were to make you the way you were meant to be. God loves you the way you are, but he loves you enough to not leave you there. And he loves your spouse enough to not leave you there. And he loves your kids enough to not leave you there. He loves your coworkers enough to not leave you there. God wants us to grow. He wants to take us from where we are and make us more into the image of Christ. He wants us to become like his son. Why? Because his son is true, his son is beauty, and his son is love. And that's what God is wanting to produce in our lives. That's what he wanted to preach to the disciples. He said to the disciples, follow me, I'll make you fisher of men. Follow me, I'm going to take you from fishing for fish, and I'm going to do something in your life that makes you a fisher of men. The way the word tells us is that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. So yes, when we come to Christ, we got the whole thing, but there's a, there's a sanctification, there's a process that he wants to grow and mature our faith, develop us in the process. I put it this way, we want to live more like Jesus. We want more beauty, more truth, more love, more meekness, kindness, patience, goodness, and self-control, the fruits of his spirit. We want to grow. I hope you are at this point in your life and your walk with Jesus. You want to grow. You don't want to just be where you are. You want to progress. You want to deepen. You want to get closer to Jesus. You want your life to be more compelling and more missional. You want to be a more devoted follower of Christ, a more devoted friend, husband, wife, father, mother, son, and daughter, more courageous and competent in your Christian walk. Um, I, someone just gave me this book just a couple of days ago, and I read the first chapter, and I was just like, <sighs> direct hit. The rest of the book could be horrible, but it, the, the, I read the first chapter, so I'm recommending it. It's called Sacred Fire. It's guy by, um, done by a guy named Ronald Rollheiser. And it's a vision for a deeper human and Christian maturity. And the way he just described this desire, this graduation, this progression that is supposed to be happening in our walks with Jesus was so compelling and so stirring in me. I just hope that all of us want to grow. He said the basic questions that we ask at the beginning of our life, but also at the beginning of our life of faith, is who am I, who loves me, and how will my life turn out? These are youthful questions of insecurity, he says, trying to get our lives together. They're not wrong, but it's a beginning stage. And he says what, what we need to do is we need to get, and this whole book is about this next stage. And he calls it the deeper human mature Christian questions. And the first one is, how can I give my life away more purely and more meaningfully? That is a beautiful question. Not how can I get richer, how can I get better, how can I get this or how can I get that. How can I give my wife, my, and I'm, <laughs> is she here? Oh, she's not here? No, just kidding. I don't know how to recover from that. How can I give my life, my life, away more beautifully or more purely and more meaningfully? The second question he asks, and this one's deep. You ready for this one? How do I live beyond my heartaches, headaches, and obsessions 
so as to make other people's lives more meaningful? Those are good questions, you guys. Those are not easy answer questions. But we've got to graduate to these type of questions if we really want to see our lives become more like Christ. Because this is what Jesus did with his life. He said that if he writes another book, he's going to write a book on the last question, which is the deepest human question. How do I make my death the last great gift I give to my loved ones? I don't even know how to go there. But again, these are beautiful, beautiful questions. These are discipleship questions. These are questions that the Spirit of God is wanting to bring answers to in our lives if we'll allow him. So how do we grow? How do we live like Jesus? How can we partake in the, part, uh, in the, in the practice of becoming more like Jesus? Well, first we have to remember, and I would be a horrible pastor if I didn't say this. You can't. There's nothing you can do to become more like Jesus in your own strength. You can try, you can self-help it, you can willpower it, you can do all of those things, but basically all you're doing is putting makeup on something. God alone is the one who can bring increase. Just like a tree with no sun, water, or soil, it's not doing anything. It's just drying up. But when we, through spiritual practices, spiritual disciplines, Do these things. What we're doing is we're plugging in ourselves to something deep, something that can bring transformation. And so like we said with fasting, fasting maybe can do some biological shifting or maybe even a little psychological shifting. But fasting is not going to produce anything good in our lives unless God himself comes and, and, and meets with us. The disciplines are creating space for encounter with God. They're not rubbing the lamp to get the genie to do what we want. They're just basically saying, God... I'm going to create this space in my life, this space in my routine, this space in my hunger, this space in my appetites for you to show up and do whatever you want to do. I'm just the clay. You are the potter. But I want to be clay that is soft and easy to manage and mold. A lady, as I spoke this message in first service, she said she got this, this vision of, of, of the ground um, being kind of covered in water. It was like deep in water. And, 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 and what, what she was noticing was that the water was not sinking in. The water was just stuck because of the hard ground or because of whatever was going on the ground. The, the water couldn't sink in. And the spiritual practices basically are, it's how we kind of till the soil and make sure our lives are in a place where the water can sink in. What God wants to do actually sinks in and it doesn't just kind of stay on the surface. It deepens us. It enriches us. Um, one thing to think about as far as this idea of God, the one bringing the increase, you could think of that little boy bringing his five loaves and two fish, right? So Jesus is there. There's 5,000 men. They're all angry because John the Baptist just got beheaded. And Jesus is like, let's feed these guys. And his disciples are like, <laughs> I mean, they didn't say that to his face probably, but they're like, <laughs> We're going to feed these guys. We got no food. We got no money. We followed you. We left all the fish. We left all of our income. We're out here just in the wilderness, desolate, desolate, desolate. And now you want us to feed everybody? Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this little boy's like, I could help. And he brings his five loaves and two fish, right? And the, they're like, eh. and Jesus is like, come here, man. And he goes over there, and Jesus is like, perfect. And he takes these five loaves and two fish. And he feeds 5,000 men, and they got 12 baskets left over. That kid went home that day, and he was like, here, Mom. Boom. There's a basket of fish and, and bread. And the mom was like, what? We're taking you to the casino right now, boy. <laughs> no, the mom didn't say that. I, didn't have, I don't know if they had casinos and things. But, but he, he comes home with so much more. God took the little offering that he had, and he multiplied it. He multiplied it, and Spiritual disciplines are the way we bring our five loaves and two fish to Jesus. Spiritual practices are the way that we offer ourselves to the multiplying and transformative work of Jesus. Jesus went into the wilderness led by the Spirit for the transformative work that was supposed to happen so he could overcome the enemy and he could step into the public ministry that God was calling him to do. There was a link between the two. 
And that's what we're trying to see. So we talked about spiritual disciplines last week. You can pop that graphic up from Dallas Willard. These are two guys that have been really helpful teaching on the spiritual disciplines. Dallas Willard, Richard Foster. You can read their books and all of those things. But um, Dallas Willard separates them. Disciplines of abstinence, solitude, silence, fasting, frugality, chastity, secrecy. That's like the no Amazon stuff. Um, but it's, it's things that we're abstaining from, we're pulling away from in order to create space for encounter with God. Whereas disciplines are engagement, study, worship, celebration, service. These are things we're stepping into to create uh, space for encounter with God. Richard Foster um, calls them inward disciplines, which are meditation, prayer, fasting, study. Those are things that are going on inside. Outward disciplines, simplicity, solitude, submission, service. They're kind of like quieting the noise around us. And then corporate disciplines are the confession, uh, worship, guidance, celebration. That's what we're doing right here. Well done, everybody. You made the list. You made the list. Um, okay, so with that being said, last week we also talked about how the spiritual disciplines curtail our appetites. Sometimes we, we, we feel like we don't have a lot of passion for the things of God. And really what that means is we've been spending our passions on other things. And so what fasting does is it basically kind of pulls everything together and it stokes up our past. It curtails our appetites for other things and it kind of strengthens our appetites for the things of God. So gratification, we talked about how we're so addicted to gratification. Amazon now, Amazon Prime, give it to me now, I need it now, everything's got to show up now, right now, instant gratification. And fasting is such a defiance in that. It's such a way to curtail those appetites. And I'm not even saying those appetites are all bad. Some of them are, some of them are not. Illicit and, and, and licit desires. But fasting actually kind of helps bring everything into check. Um, addiction to consumption, the amount of hours that we, people say, people say now that um, adults are consuming 11 hours a day of, of, of media, social media and all those type of things. 11 hours a day. You sleep for eight hours, not a lot left over. And that's not just young people. They're talking about like 50-year-olds doing that. So you 50-year-olds, you can't be like, oh, it's just the kids are ruining everything. No, you are. <laughs> Maybe. I'm 46, so I can talk trash on the 50-year-olds still. <laughs> For like 10 more minutes, I can talk trash on them. <clears throat> Got to do it while I can. Um, addiction to self, project self. Everybody knows that the world's really trying to Teach us to be selfish. Um, it's curtailed by prayer, correct prayer, praying for others, serving others, serving the poor. Um, and if we have time, we'll get to this. But addiction to the approval of man, I think, is curtailed by solitude. You might have to study that on your own because we might run out of time today. We did first service. But um, those connections, I think solitude really does help us with the approval of man. Um, where we want to be liked, we want to be popular, we want to be all these things. But then God asks us to enter into loneliness in some ways. And to make sure that it's, uh, it's him that we're, that we're getting our approval from and then calling us back into the world. But anyways, now we're going to focus on solitude. Um, let's look back to the scriptures. Mark chapter 1, we read. That's where it says, rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place and he prayed. Mark 1, 45, just a bit later says, but he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. Mark 6, 31, he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no, no leisure even to eat. Mark 6, 32, and they went out into a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Uh, Mark 6, 35, and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. And uh, that's right before the feeding of the 5,000, but... Desolate place, it was a common practice of Jesus. Luke actually says Jesus often withdrew to desolate places. In the Greek, the word is eremos, um, and it, it's not just solitude. It's not just alone time. For all the extroverts in the room, you're like, hmm, that sounds good. Preach it, brother. But it's not, it's not like just kind of going off on your own, having a little coffee, a little quiet time, maybe putting some headphones in and just chilling and just, ah. the word desolate place is, is, is actually a good translation. There's more to it than just going to be by yourself. It's entering a place that's uncomfortable for you. It's abstaining from things that give you comfort, like people, like sound, 
like noise. And it's allowing yourself to be in a place that begins to be uncomfortable or being there long enough for it to become uncomfortable. The word oremos connects into what is the wilderness. That's another way it's described. In Mark chapter 1, he actually says wilderness. In Mark chapter 1, he says desolate. Both of them are from the Greek word oremos. And it ties back into the Old Testament where we have guys like Abraham were called out of Ur of Chaldees, called out of the city and to go sojourn in this promised land where he basically was just out there alone with his family. And there God met him and he heard God's voice, received the promise of God. And that's continued on. That theme, Moses, we know, is someone that went out into Midian and was in the wilderness and then the burning bush showed up. And he got an assignment from God. And he goes and he calls all the million people, all of the million Jews that were in Egypt. And they go out into the wilderness. And there in the wilderness, they are humbled, they are tested. And they get to hear from God in a unique way. They get the Ten Commandments. They get provided for. Out in the wild, they see that God is not just a God of, you know, riches, God of the city. He's a God of the wilderness. He's a God of the desolate. Oftentimes, that's the easiest place to find him in our seasons of desolation. And Elijah himself even is, is this powerful man of God, and he's called out for, to go into the, the river Jabbok. And he's there, which seems like, for almost three years. And it says the ravens came and fed him. It's crazy. And there he, he spent some time. Every great man or woman of God, it seems like, has to find their path through the desolate place. There's something about the desolate place that is so important to our preparation for what God wants us to do. It was a frequent practice of Jesus to go to the desolate place. It was a place of testing, a place of humbling, a place away from society and normal routines, not vacation time or me time, a time of abstaining and loneliness, a time of listening to your own thoughts in the presence of God. A time of preparation, turning down the volume of external life to listen to what's happening inside and listening for God's still, small voice of truth. The desolate place is not a peaceful place. Solitude and silence do not lead us to solitude and silence. It's crazy. It's true. Solitude and silence reveal all the voices and desires and insecurities and expectations that we are carrying and have distracted ourselves from by all the external noises. The silence around us reveals the noise inside of us. You're not doing it wrong if your times of silence and solitude are chaotic. Once it becomes chaotic, you know you finally reached the wilderness, the wild earnest. That means nothing. I was just doing that. There's no like, oh, was that Greek? No, that is nothing. It's just dumb. Um, the desolate place. Because quieting the outside world just helps us to hear what's going on in our souls. And the truth is, chaos might be the best way to describe your soul. It's my soul. For Elijah, at one point, he was totally distraught. He was totally overcome. The Lord had just done this amazing thing, but he's not feeling it. And he goes and sits in a cave. And there in the cave, it says this fire came. This powerful, powerful fire ripped through the cave. And it says the Lord was not in it. And then there was this earthquake that shook everything. And Elijah probably thought, Elijah was praying that God would kill him right before this, literally. And then this fire comes, and he's like, okay, the Lord's doing it. And then there's an earthquake. Oh, the Lord wasn't in that either. And then there's this wind that is just whipping and tearing. He's like, okay, this is it. God's, just, God's spirit, God's wind is just going to destroy me. God wasn't in that either. And then it says, a still, small voice spoke out to Elijah. And there's something about that. There's something about going into this quiet space, being in this solitude, being alone, alone with yourself, and with the God of the universe, that can be very intimidating, very chaotic, very scary. And for solitude to actually happen, what I've found is it, it takes time. 
I can't just go be in solitude for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, you know, just, like, solitude takes time. It's funny, we have this dog named Luther. He's 13 years old now. He's just old. But he's still happy. He's just super old. But all his life, um, we got him as a rescue, and he's always been very skittish. So, like, anytime somebody's loud or anytime, does, like, the, you could feel the tension rising in the room, he's like, mm-hmm, he's gone. And most, some days he doesn't even come out because our family's a little chaotic, you know. But it's always interesting because if everything's quiet enough and still enough for long enough, all of a sudden Luther will come up to you. Just kind of wagging his tail, and he'll come say hi. And it's funny, whenever that happens, I'm like, it must be peaceful in here. It must be peaceful in here because he's out here. And there's something about that, letting all of that kind of go, go through it. And it's, it's hard, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. It's so hard to stay in there because the chaos is sometimes. I was talking with a guy we were walking this week, and he said, whenever I get alone, all of my fears, just, they just start to feel like they're just grab, gripping me. He says, it is, it's torture. I hate it. It's a desolate place. It's a desolate place. But it's a place that God wants to meet us. Think of the, the, the disciples on the boat, right? The storm, the wind, the waves, everything. They're freaking out. And Jesus is asleep on the boat. And they're like, Jesus, could you wake up? And he wakes up. And he's like, what's the big deal? And they're like, oh, look around. And he's like, oh, is this a problem for you? Is this a problem for you guys? Oh, okay. And he just calms it all down. Now you guys happy? Can I go back to sleep now? I don't know how it went, but that's in my mind how it went. Um, But he calms all the storm, and they're like, yeah, that's cool. Thanks, Jesus. That's good. And he's like, you guys didn't think I had a control? They're like, no, we thought you had a control. We just, we wanted to see that. We just wanted to see something, you know. (laughs) He calls them little faith, all these things. But Jesus is like, I'm okay with the chaos. I'm here. Sit here with me. Sit here with me. So that's solitude and the desolate place. Now I want to talk about solitude and the secret place. We talked about the Sermon on the Mount last week, Matthew chapter 6. There's a little bit more to it here. Um, verse 3 says, But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that you, your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you fast... Put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will be obvious to others that you are, that you are, we won't be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Um, there's something very important to Jesus that we figure out what the secret place is all about. That, that we have in our lives things that we do that are only for God. No one else gets to see it. And it makes sense in a relationship. My wife and I, we need to have alone time. We need to have things that only the two of us know about. There's something so bonding and beautiful about that. And so right and good. It's so nurturing. It's deepening in our relationship. If we never had alone time, if we never had things that only the two of us knew about, it would be weird. It would be shallow. We wouldn't know where we were at. And the truth is, is when we get alone, sometimes we realize, hey, we're not doing so good. We haven't been spending enough time alone cultivating this enough. So let's get back to that. And sometimes we get alone, it's like, yeah, that's good, man, that's good, that's good. And the same is true with our, with our relationship with God. Jesus wants us to cultivate our relationship with God, which requires alone time with God in the secret place. Church gatherings are great, but they're not alone time with God. Serving others is great, but Jesus wants a personal relationship with you first and foremost. I know it sounds crazy, but I can tell you it's real. Jesus is alive, and he actually talks with me, and he walks with me. Jesus is my friend. I know that might sound so cheesy or embarrassing to you, but he has been such a close friend of mine. Whether I've gotten it right or wrong, he's always been there. As a friend, and I'm not using that word lightly, I mean it. He has been such a good friend to me. In so many ups and downs of life. I love being alone with him. For me, what this looks like oftentimes is getting away, 
And sure enough, the chaos of my thoughts and burdens and worries and fears and all these different things come to the surface. And they're just, and I just let them run. I'm like, go for it, guys. Solitude time, man. It's supposed to be wild. Let's make it wild. And sure enough, it's like, just running. But then what I've, what I've learned to do is I, I, as I'm doing that, as I'm in that space and just kind of, I'm just kind of watching my thoughts in some ways. And then the, it, inevitably at some point there seems to be like some other thoughts are mingling with my thoughts. And I begin to notice these thoughts. I begin to train my brain to kind of notice when that's happening. And these other thoughts, they don't come from me. I know that. They're, they're too wise or they're too beautiful or they're not at all what I'm feeling or what I want to do. They're actually in the opposite direction. And I start to notice those thoughts and I start to spend more time thinking about those ones. And those are the ones that I write down. I don't write down the other ones. I start to write down those ones. And what's funny is when I write those ones down and I grab onto those, they bring me peace. They don't necessarily get rid of the chaos, but now I have peace in the chaos. I have something to hold on to. I have an anchor in the storm. And those are the things that carry me through. And that's a bit of what my prayer life has been. That's a bit what solitude has been like for me. We don't have time to get into the next little bit. I'll just try and sum it up. But um, the devil came to Jesus one time and, and offered him all the splendor and all the authority of the world. Basically all the approval of, of humanity. And Jesus uh, didn't, didn't take it. He said that I only want the approval of my father. That's all I need. Jesus wanted to be loved and liked by everyone, no doubt about it. And the devil offered that to him without having to go to the cross. The devil was offering Jesus um, what he wanted, but also what God wanted to some extent, but not in the way God wanted. The devil was offering Jesus a way to avoid all the rejection and disappointment and heartbreaking betrayal. But if Jesus took it before going to the cross, he would not have provided a way for us to experience his love. He would have gained the whole world but forfeited us. So what Jesus did is he chose to walk alone through the bitterness of betrayal, rejection, hatred, and injustice because that was the path which would pay the debt for you and I. Thanks be to God for the gift of his son. Thank you, Jesus, for being rejected so I could be accepted. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing your heart to be broken so my heart could be made whole. Thank you, Jesus, for being betrayed so I could know faithful love. And thank you for Jesus for going through loneliness so I could be in your family forever. This is the work that Jesus did. This is the practice that he has left for us to walk in. And so God does want us to be people that go into the desolate place to cultivate our relationship with God so that we can be meaningful and important as we pour out our lives in the public place. Let's pray. Just take a moment and listen for that still small voice. As I was praying this morning, a still small voice did come and, and said this, so I'll just offer this to you. There's a flood coming that will wash away all the lukewarm in the church and in our lives. The cost of following Jesus is going to increase and many will compromise and cave in, desiring the approval of man over the approval of God. But the ones who know about the secret place, who have made alone time with Jesus a daily bread, whose roots have gone deep because of deep soaking in solitude, will be able to stand and shine in the day of opposition. This is such an important practice for us this year. And Jesus, we pray that you would, you would lead us in this. We pray that your spirit would whisper to our hearts, come away with me, and we would respond. Thank you, Lord, that you want us and that you want us to grow.
pray that we would. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, now we get to witness some baptisms. Um, Jesus himself was baptized. It was a practice of Jesus. And so we um, are real big on that as well. And so Kurt's going to come up and lead us in a, a time of baptism. Please welcome all of these coming up, these courageous ones, to be baptized. So proud of them. I love it that so many people in our church have made the decision. They've heard the Lord call them to the waters of baptism. And uh, it's beautiful. And as, as David said, Jesus was even baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Wasn't that a great message? And we just want to follow his example. We're here to just follow him and become like him. And so one of the things that Jesus said was, allow the children to come to me. Many that are here being baptized today are children. And they really, we took the time to make sure they understand the meaning of baptism, and they really understand what they're doing today, and we're proud of them. Paul said it this way, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So when we repent of our sins, and we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, all of our sins are nailed to the cross we are risen with him to live a new life in his resurrection power. So now, as all of you are being immersed in, the, in that watery grave, you're going to be buried with Jesus, and you're going to be raised in his resurrection life. So now they're going to share a profession of faith. Um, I love Jesus, and I'm ready to continue on and build my relationship with him. Hi, um, I'm Ella, and I want to be baptized because I love Jesus, and I want to show that I choose to follow him my whole life. Mark 16, 16 says this. Whoever is baptized, I mean, whoever believes and is baptized is saved. Hi, my name is Max, and I want to be baptized because I want to follow Jesus for the rest of my life and show my friends at school the way to go and follow Jesus. Hi, my name is Emma. I want to be baptized because I want to follow Jesus my whole life. Hi, my name is Brooklyn, and... Um, well, I want to be baptized um, because I love Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. You know, I, I really felt like, um, you know, the Bible says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. And boldness is courage. And as you guys are having the courage to step out and be obedient, it's like you're developing this muscle that God is going to bless you, and he's going to make you more confident, more bold, and more fearless in your walk with him. Amen? So let's stretch our hands towards each of these and pray a blessing over them. Lord, we thank you for each and every one of these young people, Lord, that has made the decision to be baptized today. Thank you that they love you. We thank you, Lord, for the calling you have on each of their lives and we pray, just as David talked about hearing that still, small voice, they will be able to hear your voice speaking over them, well done, that you are so pleased with each of them. We pray your blessing that they will never forget this all the rest of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go get baptized.
for being here this morning. So grateful to see you and to have you celebrate with us these baptisms. Um, if you're new, I want to encourage you to fill out a connection card in the pew in front of you. And there's a white tent out in the courtyard. So be sure to stop by there. If you need prayer this morning, there's a bunch of people who would love to pray for you up here. Um, and if you have any youth students, there's also going to be a table out in the courtyard to sign them up for winter camp. We love you guys and we'll see you on Wednesday.